Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Jess Lenore in Baltimore. Human rights organizations are warning almost 8 million people are facing acute hunger due to rising violence and, displ and displacement in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The new figure represents a 30% increase over the last year, with more than 1 in 10 people living in rural areas suffering from acute hunger. In the Kasai region of the DRC, some 1.4 million people have been forced to flee their homes over the past year. In June, the Catholic Church reported that Congolese security forces and a militia fighting them had killed at least 3,383 people in that region alone since October. Reuters spoke to several people directly impacted by the violence. <laughs> Mais nous avons des ressources limitées qui ne pouvaient atteindre et servir que 5000 ménages. Actuellement, il euh, y, y, y a autour de la ville euh, 70 000 qui sont dans les besoins, soit autour de 12 000 ménages, dont nous avons un gap de plus de 7 000 ménages qu'il faut encore euh, couvrir euh, en assistance euh, agricole. Mais Congo has some of the largest mineral reserves in the world, which has been both a blessing and a curse because it's been made a, for, a target of foreign powers for hundreds of years. Well, now joining us to discuss this and more is Maurice Carney. He's the executive director and co-founder of Friends of the Congo. He's fought alongside Congolese human rights activists for nearly two decades in their pursuit of peace and justice in the Congo. Thanks so much, Maurice. So we know that uh, violence has escalated in Congo since President Joseph Kavila has refused to step down after his mandate ended in December. Uh, many fear growing fighting could spark a repeat of the tragic and enormous conflicts seen between 1996 and 2003, mostly in the east of Congo. Millions died, many from hunger. Um, give us the latest on the ground. Well, uh, the latest, uh, you, you tapped into it, that, that there is widespread instability throughout the country. And a central source of that instability is a weak um, political um, situation, a situation whereby the Joseph Kabila, who, um, whose term expired in December of uh, 2016, is trying to hold on to power by uh, any means necessary. And as a result of his trying to hold on to power, uh, that has uh, fueled uh, a lot of um, conflict, uh, uh, instability uh, throughout the country. So that's really the, the source of the instability, or the major source of instability right now is um, the tenuous political situation, uh, which uh, has come about as a result of uh, Kabila trying to hold on to power against the will of the people. Congo is one of the wealthiest countries in the world if you look at the mineral resources um, that it's extracting and its reserves, yet the country faces some 40 percent inflation. Uh, as we mentioned, millions of people are food insecure. Are the policies of the Kabila government responsible for this? Yes, um, in, in large part, uh, the policies are, are responsible um, for uh, the dire situation that we see. Um, however, it's, it's important for your viewing audience to uh, understand that um, we have a country, as you said, that ha on the one hand has uh, tremendous wealth. Uh, some estimates uh, have it up to $24 uh, trillion in natural wealth in the, in the country. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you have the dire statistics, some of which you've laid out. Um, over the years, the United Nations uh, have, uh, have what they call the, the Human uh, Development Index, where Congo has uh, come in uh, near the bottom and at the, either at the bottom or near the bottom over the last um, few years. Uh, so however, what you have is a, uh, is a country that's uh, being pilfered, is being plundered. Uh, both um, by its elites, um, led by Joseph Kabila, 
and also by the international community. Uh, the current um, head of the United Nations, uh, Antonio Guterres, uh, in, in 2008, uh, he gave an interview to the uh, a wide ranging interview to the Financial Times, where he, um, he stated that uh, we must not forget that the international community has systematically looted the Congo. So uh, the Congo um, exists and its current le leadership exists in a global system uh, that has plundered uh, the country uh, for the last 125 years at, at least, uh, since the 125 years or so, at least since the, the Berlin Conference of 1884-1885. So Joseph Kabila is really the next um, uh, puppet, I guess you can say, um, in line that has um, come into a system that's been in existence um, for uh, decades or over 100 years now. And he's, uh, he could not have arrived in power uh, without the backing of the United States on Western nations, who are really the um, end source of the pilfering of the, the country. Now, uh, Kabila, as, um, the way he's carrying out this, uh, the, this plunder uh, is by, um, over, or at least of late anyways, by overstaying his uh, constitutional mandate, which expired in December of uh, 2016. And in order to um, maintain himself in power, he had to install a, a security um, apparatus um, throughout the country and place the bulk of uh, his government's energies on that security apparatus. And by virtue of his doing that, he's left um, other sectors of the, uh, the society uh, to uh, basically descend into, into disarray, whether we're talking about, you know, the health sector, we're talking about questions of food security, whether we're talking about questions of uh, education. Uh, so his misrule has uh, only exacerbated an, uh, an already existing system that's built on, uh, on plunder, that's built on the stealing of uh, Congo's wealth, uh, that's built on the suppression of the people, that's built on the de maintaining the country in a state of dependency, uh, and that's built on maintaining the, the country in a, in a state of impoverishment. So it's both the local elites and a global, global uh, capitalist system, a global imperialist system uh, that, uh, res that has resulted in what we see today in the, um, in the Congo. And speaking of mineral, that topic of mineral wealth, uh, Congo has a, a massive supply of the world's cobalt, which is used in cell phones, in green technology, in electric cars. Talk about the latest uh, news regarding that. We know some 100,000 Congolese um, work in, in these mines. 40, some 40,000 of them are children. Uh, there's been news recently with Apple and other um, uh, uh, corporations saying they're cracking down on abusive labor practices. Um, give us, give us the story there. To cobalt, it's um, vital to to the functioning of our our, de our devices. And uh, uh, the interesting uh, paradox is, as we advance green technology here in the West, uh, we become more dependent on the cobalt coming out of the the Congo, um, particularly in the uh, electric car um, sector, uh, where you have um, car makers like uh, Tesla, um, uh, Volkswagen will be bringing cars online, uh, the electric cars, um, you have Prius. So yeah, you have a number of major um, auto companies that uh, ostensibly will be um, reliant on the cobalt coming out of the, of the Congo. Uh, now, I know um, Tesla said, well, they, they, they can function without um, Cobalt coming out of the Congo, uh, but uh, that's highly um, improbable. Uh, Congo is the central source of cobalt for, for the global uh, economy. However, uh, as I've shared with you, within the context of, uh, of plunder and pillage, uh, the Congolese, uh, particularly the youth who are, or the children who are in the mines, are, are the ones who are going to uh, be suffering uh, from the need that we have uh, have in, in the West. 
Now, some um, advocates are saying, well, what we need is uh, to have um, a clean supply line, uh, make sure that children are not in the mines, uh, and that uh, the, the cobalt can be extracted uh, without um, any human suffering. However, within the current system that we have, where the Congolese people uh, do not have resource sovereignty, do not have control over their resources, and have a leadership that was imposed on them um, by the West, uh, we're going to have a situation where they'll continue to be um, exploited, where they won't be the primary beneficiaries, and where you'll need a, a strong leader uh, uh, that's backed by the West uh, to keep the, the, the people down as they try to resist the exploitation, as they try to resist the, the repression. So uh, the way out, um, JSL, um, so that we don't hop from one mineral to the next, where today we're talking, yesterday we're talking about coltan, today we're talking about cobalt, is for the Congolese people uh, to assert control over the, the country. And that's really the big battle that's unfolding right now, where Congolese youth uh, are at the forefront of uh, resisting uh, uh, Western backed and imposed uh, leadership um, over them, whereby they can ultimately uh, take control of their society and uh, assume ownership over the tremendous wealth that they have and extricate themselves uh, from a situation of dependency and impoverishment where that wealth can be utilized uh, to, to benefit them, uh, where they can have strong systems of education, um, health care, um, energy, uh, you name it. So that's really the battle that's unfolding uh, that we see in the Congo right now, where Congolese youth are trying to create a new society. Uh, the current government that's in place uh, arbitrarily re arresting them uh, across the, the, the board, uh, but yet uh, they're, they're fighting to, to bring about change. And they're, and they're reaching out to us in the global community uh, for solidarity, especially seeing that we're beneficiaries of those resources that come out of the Congo, whether it's the coltan to fuel our cell phones so we can tweet and uh, lead um, um, social justice movements here, or the cobalt that's vital for uh, the functioning of our cell phones and keeping them charged. Uh, so there's a perfect nexus or an ideal nexus there for um, social justice movements uh, throughout the globe, particularly in the West, to be in solidarity with Congolese youth who are trying to uh, bring about change in their country. All right, Maurice Carney, thank you so much for joining us, executive director and co-founder of Friends of the Congo. We will certainly keep following all these developments and these stories from the Congo. We know it does not get the attention it deserves. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you. Us. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us at The Real News Network.